when did you first start this? What was, um, what was your first notion that you were going to make a film? Well, the first, the first notion for me came, um, I guess it was 12 years ago. Um, my middle son had been paralyzed. I was out of work caring for him, and um, I was pulling weeds one day. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I try to get my shit back together again in the garden. <laughs> and um, so I was pulling weeds, and all of a sudden it dawned on me that... Um, we know a great deal in this country about the civil rights movement because much of the civil rights movement happened in public places. But this work, work to end violence against women, a great proportion of that work has gone on behind closed doors, in shelters, in courtrooms, in the back rooms of courtrooms, sitting in an emergency department, whatever. And it's powerful and it's wonderful work. I think it's some of the strongest civil rights work we've ever done in this country. And so um, at the time, I, I knew a, a woman in California who was a filmmaker, and she and I first started working on it. And then, you know, as I said, it's hard to get things financed. It took finding Cindy to, to really launch this project. And, uh, you know, and then Cynthia, I think appropriately, um, thought that there was value in showing this from a very intimate perspective. Um, I think that it, it clears up a lot of misconceptions about what battered women actually deal with in this country because it's not like an episode of Law and Order or CSI or whatever. It's much more complex than that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's been captured in this film. When I was growing up in Toledo, uh, there was no such crime as domestic violence. It was just called life. And the object of the police success in their view was to get the victim and the victimizer back together. Mm -hmm. The actual jurisprudence was that it was more important to preserve the privacy and sacredness of the home than to pursue violence within the home. That was the jurisprudence. So until in other countries too, in England and many different countries, and until women and men began to speak out about this. And it's important that men are speaking out. You know, there, there are a whole group of uh, enormous, brave, strong football players, which is important to remember it, <laughs> since we have the NFL, who stand up and talk in public about what it meant to them as children to see their mothers brutalized. And they too are part of this movement. There are a lot of men's groups that are part of this movement. Um, but before I want us to be able to, to uh, ask questions, too, or to make comments, but um, you and I are hogging the time here. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to say anything before we begin this? I just think it's important that everybody knows um, n not to ask why. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a good point that this film brings across. Um, and I'm just glad Cynthia and Kit um, makes that point. Are you living in that house? No, I'm not. <laughs> I did live in that house for a while, but um, I'm so not to town. currently. Yeah, I moved to town. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's closer to school. Do you feel mm -hmm. safe outside of jail? Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Cynthia, do you want to complete any of this before we open it up? Uh, I, it's, I mean, it's definitely a long journey, and I've been on six years of this journey with Kit. So um, when I came on board, it was this historical film. And for me, I was just compelled by Kit and Kit's work. That's what motivated me, was watching her interact with people like Deanna and Stacy, and also watching her work with law enforcement and judges and lawyers and, and in shelters. And this was a world I had never seen before. I'd never seen it portrayed in the media. And I thought, if we're going to really tackle this issue, we really needed to understand it from an advocate's perspective. And um, I think it works, you know, because Kit takes us on this journey and through her we have this access to a world that you never see 
a hidden world, a private world, and I think that's why it works. Mm -hmm. I do tons and tons and tons of community education, and, and I have grown accustomed over the years to having people sort of reflexively turn and, and dump on the woman or the women. And so I thought, okay, I have to come up with a reference point. And so I, now when I go out to do community ed, I will say to people, think about the last time a bank was robbed in your community. Maybe that bank's been robbed five times already. But the 911 call goes out, and law enforcement respond to the 911 call. They investigate the crime. They dust for fingerprints. They interview all the witnesses. When they're done with the investigation, they don't go to the bank president and say, why'd you keep all that money here? We've already been out here five times. Do you like getting robbed? I can't believe that you've still got this bank here in this location. You must like this. So I think what we have to start to do is ask why we as a society are so hell-bent on blaming women when men are violent towards them, whether it's physical violence, sexual violence, controlling stuff, whatever. And, and, and just start to also, I mean, what's our chief form of entertainment? Violence against women. So it's, it all, it all cross-pollinates. And I think one of the things that's important about private violence is it shows what happens when we sort of collectively accept this level of entertainment that comes at the expense of women and how that plays out behind closed doors and how, in essence, we're driving the getaway car for these guys because we're just saying this is just the way it is, this is, we're just letting it go. So it's a big question and it also is an intimate question. A lot of battered women are wonderful moms but then a lot of battered women wind up paying for it times, God knows how many times, like in, in Deanna's case where they took Martina away from her. So, um, so it's never just about the abuser, it's always about the systems as well that collude with the abusers knowingly or unknowingly. Um, I'm not gonna speak for Deanna, I will only speak as someone who has observed her a lot with Martina. And um, she's, she's done just an incredible job with helping Martina sort through all the feelings. Everything we know so far tells us that if a child has even one person in her or his life who says, you're a good person, what's happening to you is wrong, it isn't your fault, uh, you know, and, 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 and listens to and cherishes that person, then you have a chance. Then you, you know, can get out. I do a lot of training with law enforcement. I've been under contract with the state of California for 17 years training cops out there. And, um, and I think a lot of law enforcement officers, certainly not all of them, but a lot of them are aware of the deep flaws in the system. And the really good ones want to try to do as much as they possibly can to find remedies for those flaws because they understand the interconnectedness between what goes on at home and what goes on on the streets and they really care. Men get born into this culture that, that urges them to commit what I think of as supremacy crimes mm -hmm. because they don't have any other motive. They're not making money. You know, they're not getting a job. They're not, it's not about stealing diamonds. No, and often, sometimes they commit suicide themselves mm -hmm. after they, they have, you know, committed these crimes. It is all about getting obsessed with and addicted to supremacy and control. But we have, we have huge amounts of, of power. We have the power of social disapproval. We have the power of noticing, right? Of seeing when we see somebody with a bruise and of supporting, of protecting, of inviting people into our houses. I mean. So I just encourage you all to be very mindful you know, think about when a woman in your community picks up the phone or walks into her domestic violence program to get help with a restraining order. How do those dominoes go down? Do they go down effectively or do they just kind of go all over the place and then she winds up back with her abuser? So just, just be critical thinkers. Okay.